I want to show you something kind of creepy. <laughs> How's that for starting a nugget? So, so last last nugget, we kind of went through the base configuration of our switch, right? I'm I'm back on the console port now. Uh, we set it up with a management IP address. <laughs> All right, that's it. I'm changing the password. <laughs> I can't talk and type uh, CBT nuggets at the same time. I'm going. I'm going in. Enable. Uh, uh, enable secret Cisco. There we go. Something I can brainlessly type. Oh, oh. There's a fun message. Um, <laughs> I'm like, I want to show you something. Now I'm on something totally different than what I plan to show you. Uh, it says the enable secret you've chosen is the same as your enable password. This is not recommended. Please re-enter the enable secret. Remember we talked about in the in the last uh, nugget, actually two nuggets ago, a difference between enable password and enable secret. Now when I when I said enable secret is Cisco. Uh, what what the Cisco device is saying is well that's the same thing as your clear text version or you know the the, the Cracker Jacks encrypted version right here they're like that's not recommended now now let me ask you this in that message anywhere does it say I didn't take that hmm no it didn't it it actually will take it just fine it it the enable secret is indeed Cisco Cisco just wants to try and sway you as much as they possibly can not to do that or at least to go in here and do a no enable password which I think I did in the last couple nuggets but uh I obviously didn't save my configuration so I'll do that now so uh so anyway uh, back to what I wanted to show you we assigned an IP address to this switch right here uh, so that I can manage it remotely. And then, as kind of the culmination of that configuration piece, I said, well, let's do this. I've got my computer, let me grab my pen, I've got my computer plugged into that switch uh, at 10.1.1. I think I gave it 100, and here's the switch. It is assigned 10.1.1.10, and that's, by the way, the only thing this IP address is used for is management purposes. Uh, so I, I, was, I was like, hey, well, let, let's tell that in. Well, this is what I want to show you. Remember uh, early on in the series, I opened our good friend Wireshark, and I know early on you're probably like, "Okay, that was that was intense." It, Wireshark is intense for most people that are just getting started uh, in the Cisco world. So uh, I'm going to get you familiar with it because it is a huge troubleshooting tool to where you can see information at every layer of the OSI model. And and here's what I want to show you: I'm going to open a capture right here and I, I I've the the a network adapter that I have connected to the switch is actually this little USB 2.0 fast Ethernet adapter now now you can see there's not much going on on my network I got some stuff maybe some I don't know something going on there but not much going on because I'm not really doing anything so I I will say this is the one I want to capture let's do a start so Wireshark is now monitoring that port it's seeing some you know occasional spanning tree messages which we're we're gonna uh, discuss that a little bit later but I'm gonna open up a telnet session oh wait a sec not, not like that I'm gonna do uh, uh there we go telnet 10.1.1.10 behind the scenes and I should see there we go. Uh, you know, the, I've got to change that logon message. Uh, behind the scenes, notice Wireshark is like, "Ooh, I see Telnet data. Telnet data." Now, now down here, it's like, "Okay, that's all just kind of gobbledygook." So we'll just kind of ignore that for now. So I'm going to log in. I'm going to say, "Okay, my password is Cisco," because uh, you know that's that's my Telnet password. Again, behind the scenes, Wireshark is like, "Hmm, munchy Telnet data." Uh, I'm going to go, "Okay, well, let's get into privilege mode, uh, Cisco." Type that in and, and hit the enter key and okay I think I think that's enough. Let's go ahead and stop that capture now. Uh, in here, Wireshark is like okay I've captured all this data now. If I if I really want to say well what was that data that you captured now this is layer two of the OSI model. It's saying okay well it was from uh, this source MAC address my little Apple USB adapter going to this destination uh, MAC address. Uh, I'm using these IP addresses you can see the source IP and there's a lot more stuff in the header than source and destination IP but source is 10.1.1.100 destination I mean so all of that we, we saw this previously I can go through every layer but really at the application layer of the OSI model it's saying I captured and then I captured O Oh wait a sec, that that sounds a little familiar. I captured I. Let's see where, where did that come in. I captured slash R. Oh, what is this? Well, there's a little feature in in um, Wireshark where you can actually analyze and follow the TCP stream. What that does is it tells Wireshark, you know what? This is this is one stream. I've I've highlighted one stream of data right here. How about can can you just kind of follow that and put that all back together? <laughs> Panic, art attack, uh, what, huh? 
what what what's the deal here and it, everything that I just typed in I, I telneted the switch and immediately it's like oh I saw a logon banner come across uh, user identification password and all of a sudden it's it's in red Cisco and then all of a sudden I see this en enable you know it's kind of like okay what's this and then it's in red Cisco no what's the colors represent anyway can anyone figure that out just by looking at it what what's the colors represent it's the send and receive. So essentially the blue is what my computer has received from the other side. The red is what I've sent to the other side. Now you know when I was, you saw it, when I tell that into the switch, I couldn't actually see the password. And that's because the device did not echo it back to me. Everything that you type in in, in Telnet is actually echoed back. You see, I typed in enable, which my computer actually sent. You can see the red, E, N, well, I can't, it's hard to highlight just eh, you get it you, you see the red right that's what I sent and the switch actually echoed that back to me it's like okay you sent an E let me echo it back and that's how my terminal uh, displays it and that's really the only difference is when I typed in the passwords uh, the switch turned off the echo back so it's saying okay you've sent it to me but I'm not echoing it back but is there a does anyone see a problem with this picture <laughs> I, I mean all of my uh, what I thought was a secure password it's now exposed. And if somebody in your environment knows what they're doing with Wireshark, uh, it's, it's going to expose the passwords that you're typing as you're logging into the switch. So I do this little let me show you demonstration to demonstrate that Telnet, not a good protocol. Not, I mean, good, it's functional, but not a secure protocol because if anybody has eyes to see that communication that's going between you and the uh, device, they will be able to decrypt, well, decrypt, it's not even encrypted. They'll be able to see everything that you're typing because Telnet is in clear text. Now, um, I, I don't even know if I should say this, but I, I want to because I want to tell you the truth. Uh, so let's say you are, you are sitting at your desk and you Telnet to your device. Does that mean you're totally doomed? Like somebody, you know, somebody just grabbed your password and they are now going to hack your network. Or, or, you know, worse yet, let's say you're sitting on that beach in Hawaii or at home and you telnet across the internet to a firewall uh, that you have over here. And so you're actually telnet and you're sending all of that in clear text over the internet. Does that mean that the evil beings out on the internet uh, immediately see that communication and will now hack your firewall because they have all the passwords necessary? Chances are good that that won't happen. First off, so, so I, now I don't want to give you a false sense of confidence because it is still true, still valid, that telling that's not good to use. But first off, in your environment, one of the things that switches do, and let me, let me um, bring up my drawing a little bit more. Uh, one of the things that, that switches do is... Um, my, my brain just checked out. Okay, switches separate into separate collision domains. So let's say that your router is right here and your computer is plugged in right here. Uh, and I tell that from here to here. Well, that communication only goes between your computer and that router. It's not like a hub. In the hub days, I would say there's much more of a chance of you being doomed because anybody, if this if this were a hub, anybody could open Wireshark that that wanted to and see all communication on the network. But if I'm directly telnetting from my device to that router or that firewall, well, it's only coming in my port and coming out this port. So if somebody over here, you know, here's evil person X uh, that has opened Wireshark and they're sniffing packets, they actually won't see my communication unless they start sabotaging your switch. There's a little program that anybody can download. It's free called Kane and Able. It is like a Swiss army knife of hacking tools that are, are kind of like point and click. Like you click a few buttons and you unleash a hacking attack. One of the things that they can do is unleash what's called a CAM table overflow. See, CAM stands for content accessible memory, right? It's where your switch stores all the MAC addresses that it knows about. So th if they do this successfully, what will happen is their computer will send thousands and thousands and thousands of packets into the switch sourced from different MAC addresses. So the switch is like, okay, I've learned about this and this and this and this and this and this. And their goal by doing that is to fill up the CAM table to where there's so many MAC addresses stored in there, the switch is like, I'm out of memory. I can't store anymore. 
And what the switch does at that point is turn itself into a hub. It's like, well, if I can't store anything, if my cam table is full, then I'm just going to forward everything everywhere because I don't want communication not to be received. So as soon as that happens, now this evil person can capture your telnet session. But the, my point is that it's going to take a little bit of work for them to do that. Okay, so so it's not as easy. You know, like obviously, it's easy for me because I'm actually on <laughs> the computer that's doing the telnetting. You know, and and if I'm on that computer, then you know for sure I can I can capture that. Um, or if somehow this this computer is compromised, as in there's a worm or some creepy div thing that's installed on it, a keystroke logger. I mean, there's there's all kinds of way to hack hack a computer. Uh, but that's it's it's not just as easy as opening Wireshark anywhere in the network and capturing passwords. And the same thing on the internet. Uh, if I tell that across the internet, that's really not a good practice. But does that mean we are destroyed immediately? Well, I would say no, simply because there is so much data going around the internet that you are almost secure in obfuscation <laughs> to where it's, it's just like by the sheer quantity you know terabytes and terabytes of data every minute are being transferred all around the internet you know who's to say that somebody's going to grab your telnet session uh, in there and and it would also mean that someone in the middle of your communication is going to be doing the grabbing as in you you know maybe come, came in through Cox or Quest you know or some kind of service provider that's giving you your internet connection uh, so there would be an evil person sitting there that could capture it or you you know, they pass it to, you know, Level 3 or Time Warner, you know, these big service providers, you know, and, and so there's somebody evil there. So so for those those things to happen, for somebody to capture your Telnet session, there would have to be a shady person existing at one of the service providers that you're going through, and they would have to find your conversation among the trillions of conversations that are happening across the Internet. So... So what I'm what I'm saying is it, there's different levels of paranoia, right? There's some people that are like, you know, I type my credit card into a website and it's gone. I know somebody's going to sell that and steal it and I'm I'm defrauded. I mean, there's there's people that are like Agent Scully is standing outside my door waiting for me to use my computer because then they will know everything that I'm trying to do. So so there's there's different levels and then there's people that, you know, that are kind of like, "Hey, you know what? The world is a happy place." There are no hackers. You know, it's all, you know, it's, they're, they're totally different levels of paranoia. Uh, it, the, the best thing to be, I would say it's probably better to be over paranoid than less because it's less chance of something bad happening. But just to put it into a reality, the world isn't waiting to hack your Telnet session. There are certain people that wish they could, but it's going to be very difficult for them to get that. All of that is a precursor to managing your Cisco the right way using SSH. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, well, that was kind of a long precursor, right? Well, yeah, but there was so much meat in there. You now have seen how to use Wireshark to follow a TCP stream and reassemble data. You can do that with anything. Outlook emails, Excel spreadsheets, anything that are being sent at the time, you can capture and reassemble and put it back together. We saw how uh, clear text Telnet was by design. That's just how the protocol uh, was written. And, and But at the same time, how using it doesn't mean that Big Brother suddenly comes down and says, I have the keys to your network. Uh, but, it, you know, as, as point number four, why risk it? I mean, what's the chance that somebody's going to grab your data and hack you? One, one in ten, one in a hundred, one in a million? It depends on where you are in the world and what kind of malicious person would want your data. But the point is, why take that chance? Why add that to one more thing that you have to worry about? Instead, go with Cisco's recommendation. Use Secure Shell or SSH to manage your network. Now, before I, I show you how to set it up, I want to show you how it works because when you understand this, you understand how almost all major security algorithms work across the public internet. You'll be able to explain how VPNs work, how uh, secure web surfing works, because they all use the same method as SSH. Essentially, you have a client that wants to have some kind of secure session with a server or you know, a router or a switch or whatever you want to do over some untrusted network and you know, just about any network unless uh, you know, I can uh, own every single piece of cable in there and know exactly what's on it uh, is an untrusted medium. So let's just say we've got the internet. I'm going to show you how it works for you know, secure web surfing uh, and then I'll apply it to SSH. Uh, let's say we go to HTTPS you know, bank.com, whatever online bank uh, we decide to use. Now, the big question is, well, how, how, do I, how do I know that this is secure? I mean, HTTPS, by the way, uses SSL. 
secure socket layer, uh, or it's the same same concept as SSH. Uh, how do I know that this is secure? I mean, if you think about it, in order for security to happen, the server or the client has to send an encryption key, which is essentially a mathematical formula that says, here's how I'm going to encrypt my data. It's kind of like a secret key that, that only those two can have. Well, well the problem is, if, if there's eyes on this network, if this is an untrusted network, then that's a problem. Because if I send the key, then anybody can grab the key and we're, we're doomed. Well, that's the same problem that a fellow named Martin Hellman and uh, Whitfield, uh, Whitfield Diffie uh, faced decades and decades ago, is how do you have security over a public network when you can't send security keys in clear text that anybody can grab? And they came up with a method of public key cryptography. So here's, here's how it works. Essentially, uh, the bank will have what's called a certificate. And that certificate will have an encryption algorithm on it. It's known as the public key. Now, the public key is half of an encryption formula. So essentially, anything that is encrypted with the public key can only be decrypted by something called the private key, which is kept on the server, never, ever, ever given out to anybody. Because if, if I give out that private key to anybody, then this whole algorithm fails because now anything can be de decrypted. Now, have you ever gone to a website and, and it comes up and you get that message in Internet Explorer or Chrome or Firefox or whatever, and it comes up and says, warning, this website is not trustable. You know, this, this website has a certificate that is not trustworthy. Well, in, in most of us, if you're like me, you're like, yeah, whatever, you know, continue. I want to get to the website. Well, that message heeds, it gives you a warning because what it's saying is this server may have just made up their own certificate as in nobody has gone out and really said that this website is secure and this website is who they say they are. That's why we have this concept of certificate authorities, uh, places like VeriSign and, and uh, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, I'll, I'll just throw VeriSign out there as one of them. So if I if I was a real company, I would take I would take and apply for a real certificate from VeriSign. VeriSign would say, okay, let me verify that you are who you are. What's your federal tax ID number? What you know? They would make sure that you are the real deal, and then they would issue a certificate and an encryption or essentially public private key set that is trusted by all the browsers of the world. So Chrome, you know, Internet Explorer, they, they've all agreed that they will trust VeriSign as a authority to give out these certificates and approve the servers on the internet to, to really be a valid server. Now, now, is that foolproof? No. No, it's not. But it's definitely a good uh, layer on top of it to make sure that, that uh, we don't have these false identities out there. Now, uh, so, so this guy gets a certificate, whether it was they made it up themselves or, or CI gave it, and this certificate has half of an encryption algorithm on it. So the very first time when you go to bank.com, they will send over this public key, half of an encryption algorithm. And your, your browser, your Internet Explorer, your Chrome, your whatever you're using will say, great, I am now going to generate what is called a session key. Now, that session key is only good for this one-time use only. Uh, session key is, is you know, once, once I'm done talking to this website, I'm going to flush it. It is an encryption algorithm. It is called a single key, or I guess the technical word that you would use for it, is a symmetrical encryption algorithm. One key to rule them all. One key to encrypt. One key to decrypt. Uh, it's fast, it's efficient, it's what we want to use because, uh, because we, we want to have our, our communication go as fast as possible, but also one key. So I can't just send that one key to the server across the internet because someone would get my one key and be able to decrypt it. So you see where this is going? So I send half of an encryption formula to the client. That's, that's this, this piece right here. And this is also, by the way, called asymmetric encryption, multiple keys or two keys to be specific to rule them all, uh, but very processor heavy to, to handle this kind of encryption. So uh, he sends me half of an encryption algorithm. This guy says, I'm going to take that public key and encrypt my session key. Gone. It is now scrambled. It's encrypted. And the only one that can decrypt it is bank.com because they're the only one that has this private key behind the scenes. So now, obviously, I knew what it was before I encrypted it, right? So I now send an encrypted encryption key. 
<laughs> think that one through, right? An encrypted encryption key over to bank.com, who now decrypts it using their private key. And now, ta-da, it's going to be a new color. Oh, we have the session key successfully transmitted and used on both sides for that session. A, a fresh encryption algorithm used for that session. Once that session is done, I tear it down and the session key is destroyed, never to be used again. Now, that is how uh, public key encryption works, which is really amazing. It's really powerful to have that kind of algorithm uh, on the internet as you surf the websites. It's the same thing that's used for SSH. It's the same thing when I have a, a VPN tunnel, like I want to connect to my private network uh, using a tunnel over there. They, they all use this same kind of, kind of algorithm, this public key. Now, now I know some of you are, are watching this whole thing and be like, okay, okay, come on. If somebody gets the public key, which is you know half of an encryption formula, can't they can't they figure out the private key? I mean, I I, I grew up. I, I went into some heavy math. You know, x plus one equals three. Uh, if I if I get you know half that formula, and I'm like, okay, I don't have a piece of it. Can't I you know? You see what I mean? Can't I be like, well, okay, x is really two because I can kind of reverse engineer this? Uh, no. <laughs> well, theoretically, no, but that theory has been proved for decades and decades. Now, I will tell you, if somebody came in, by, by the way, this, this is called Diffie-Hellman encryption, uh, because those two guys, well, actually, there's three guys, but he got cut out of the loop. Uh, no royalties for him. Uh, but but uh, they are the ones who pioneered this public key encryption algorithm. Now, it's, it's, since then, it's been uh, translated into many different forms. You'll hear things like RSA. There's, there's all kinds of different methods of doing public key cryptography, but the concept is all the same. Now, if somebody ever came out and said, hey, I, I've figured out how to reverse this. I've figured out how... If, if I get a public key on the internet, how to to you know to generate the private key from it, you would see worldwide chaos and panic and freaking out because people would would suddenly realize that the underpinning security of everything is now gone. Can it be done? I don't know. Maybe I can't do it. Uh, no one's been able to do it so far. The government, well, as far as we know, Agent Scully can do it, uh, but but uh, the government can't do it. So 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 far, it's been proved true. But it's a theory. The theory is nobody can figure out how to generate the private key if you have a public key. But all that being said, I, I dive into my conspiracy theory, theory side of things. Now, let's talk about how to set up SSH. Let me clear all of this stuff off. Uh, so that's that's the how it works. So instead, you know, instead of having uh, computer A and website B, you know, we have computer A going to switch A or router A or whatever kind of device. It's all the same concept. It's just uh, using a, you know different devices. So the way to configure SSH on a Cisco device is as follows. First off, we have to have a host name, and the reason why is this switch or this router is going to generate its own certificate. Now, it's okay, we don't need a certificate authority because we pay for those. And as long as we trust our own devices, you know, we're not going to have a rogue device come in into the, the play. It's okay to generate our own little public key certificate, which says who we, who we are. But we have to have on that certificate the name of our device, uh, as well as the domain name, like, you know, uh, jeremy.com or cbtnuggets.com. That's, that's a domain name. Those are two requirements for the certificate. So not only uh, on that certificate is the key, but also, you know, your name. Who are you? Uh, host name. Also on there is your domain name. Uh, also on there is the certificate authority that pr approved the certificate. Think of this as like the stamp of approval. Now, in this case, this is called a self-generated certificate that we're creating. So when it says, well, who approved me? I approved me. And who are you to tell me I can't do that? You know, that's, that's what the, the device is saying. Is, you know, I, I am my own certificate authority, but that means the very first time you connect to this device, you're going to get a warning saying, hey, I'll, I'll show you that warning. Okay, so... so Here's, here's what we're going to do. Now, I've already configured the host name for this device. It's CBT Switch. Now I need to configure a domain name. Global config mode. And the command is IP domain name followed by what we want, uh, what we want the domain name. Hang on, I'm having a 
domain. Yeah, sorry, it's IP domain name. That's that's what it is. Uh, IP domain name, uh, or it looks like we can do a space. Either either one of those. <laughs> Sometimes Cisco Cisco is inconsistent. You'll you'll have two ways of doing the same thing. So IP domain name. Uh, we've got CBT switch dot. Uh, let's do nuggetlab dot com will be our domain name that we're going to use. Okay. Now we're going to generate encryption keys. We're going to say I need to generate essentially the public private key set for uh, this certificate. The private key I will never give out. The public key anybody can have because it's only half of the formula. So the way I do that is I do crypto key generate RSA. RSA, by the way, is the uh, encryption algorithm of choice on Cisco devices. Uh, I think it stands for Revere Shamir and Adelman, or it's three guys that that developed. It's you know think of it as Diffie Hellman, but just the next flavor, a little more efficient than Diffie Hellman's original algorithm. So now we come to the big question: What is the size of the modulus? What is the si how how strong do you want this key to be? Now let me give you just just a fly by view. Symmetric keys. Uh, that we use normally for, remember I said this is the session key that our computer generates to communicate with that website. Symmetric keys, common strengths are, you know, uh, on the low end, 64-bit. Uh, normally nowadays is 128-bit. Or if you're, if you're beefy uh, nowadays, you'll use 256-bit. Uh, encryption uh, for your symmetric keys. Uh, and that's just how strong the key is, how complex is that mathematical formula um, in, in a nutshell. Uh, that's, that's really what it means. Um, so those are common methods to communicate. Now look at this. This is coming off and starting off with a modulus of 512 bits. These are much stronger than our normal day-to-day -day communications, much more complex because the device knows it's not going to use them for long. The only thing it's going to use these for is to encrypt that session key for the communication. So they're like, you know, we can take the processor hit just to do a tiny amount of encryption. If we were to actually use these keys for all communication, our devices would die. There's, there's no way they can keep up because with the strength of keys, every bit that you add to it effectively doubles the strength. It's not like 128-bit is twice as strong as 64-bit. No, it's 65-bit is twice as strong as 64-bit. 66-bit is four times as strong as 64-bit, but also four times as complex to process. So you see what I mean? So, so when you're talking 128-bit versus 64-bit, it's like you can't even compare that. It's out of the park. And same thing when you come down here. You're, you're infinitely stronger. The, the, so as our processors get bigger and bigger and bigger, we're able to uh, create these more improved algorithms because as the processor get bigger and bigger, it's easier to brute force attack uh, these 64-bit keys. You know, we can generate you know, millions of passwords every second and try it and see if, if, uh, if that's the, the secret key that's being used. So, so that's that when we come to this question, the modulus, uh, what do you want to use? The common strength is 1024 bit. Now, 512 is considered, I would say, weak for an asymmetric key set. 1024, or if you're feeling really beefy, you know, I can go with a 2048 bit. Go to the maximum that at least this device supports. Some devices will support more. Uh, but it's actually generating. It's going to take a little bit because my little processor is going <laughs> trying to generate this super strong encryption key uh, that is going to be used for communication from here on out. Just so you know, I paused the nugget. I'm still waiting. This was 30 seconds ago. Okay, I'm pausing again. Okay, about 15 seconds later. So it took about, I would say, a total of 60 seconds to generate those keys just because they're so beefy. So now I've got the encryption keys. I've, I've generated uh, this certificate. I've generated the public key. I've generated the private key. Now we need to enable it. So I'm going to go on my device and do IPSSH. We're going to say version 2. Version 1 is old uh, and I would say nowadays considered you know, bad form. It's not like somebody can hack it. It's just they've come out with improvements since then. So version 2 is the one that we want to use. Uh, that, think of that as like a light switch behind the scenes. I just turned on SSH version 2. Now we create our local user accounts. What's this? Well, SSH, unlike Telnet, relies on a username and a password. Now, you remember so far when we've been managing our device, I, I, I tell that in, I hit tell that, it just says, what's your password? I type in Cisco and I'm in. Uh, I'm able to access the device. Well, SSH requires a username and a password, or at least in the Cisco world does. So what I need to do is in global configuration mode, create a user account that I can use for SSH. 
So what I'll do is I'll I'll type in username and whatever username I want to want to use. Now, uh, bad usernames are, are things like admin, uh, root, administrator. Because if you're a hacker, those are always the accounts you're going to try first. You're going to say I'm going to brute force something name that. I mean, try, try and come up with something unique. It, it doesn't have to be your name. It could be you know company admin or it may be the name of your company ADM or so, just something something that wouldn't be so normal for people to use as the administrator. Uh, Jeremy would definitely classify as a non-normal administrator uh, username, um, or maybe you know if I want to be even more secure, I could do Jeremy Dollar Sign. There's nothing to keep you from doing that. So I'll do Jeremy host name Jeremy, uh, and then from there I can type in either password to specify the password or secret to specify the secret. Now just like the enable password or enable secret, it's much better if your device supports it to use the secret because now the username and password will not be stored as clear text in the running config so I'll, I'll say username Jeremy secret uh, Cisco just so I don't forget the password so so now I've got this user account created and if I do a show running config um, by the way, this do command, uh, again, we saw this in the last nugget, allows you to execute a show command from any mode. The only drawback of it is uh, the question mark doesn't work. So if I'm you know, testing, it's like, uh, you know, I, don't, I don't know. So the context sensitive help doesn't work. It just says line, as well as the tab key. So I can do, sh do show run. It's, it's going to say, I'm, I'm not completing it because I don't know what command you're trying to type. It, this is kind of a shortcut, if you will. So, uh, so do show run. I hit the space bar, and, and, or right there, I see username Jeremy, secret, blah, 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 blah. you know, it's just like my enable secret, it's this nice gobbledygook that is uh, encrypted there, or hashed up on the uh, screen. So now, uh, I've, I've created the local user accounts, now I need to choose to allow Telnet and I should put or SSH. Now, from the last nugget. What ports are Telnet ports? As, as in, where do I go to configure a Telnet password? You remember? Line VTY and then whatever line numbers I want to configure. Well, in my case, I want to configure all of them. All of them will support this. Now, there is a command under here. Now, now notice we've we've got uh, under this this um, uh, VTY line, we have a password. We did that in the last nugget. That's what allowed me to tell that in right here is I typed in the password of Cisco. Uh, on, on the device. So there is a password under there, but I'm going to change the story a little bit by typing in the command transport input, as in the kinds of protocols that are allowed in, that the transports, the ways that you can communicate with these VTY lines are going to be, uh, and now I can specify, SSH or Telnet. You can say none, and that totally disables all remote access. Don't want to do that. All would do both of them. Or you could type in, for instance, if I wanted to still allow both Telnet and SSH, I could type in Telnet and SSH. I, and that, that says I will allow both of them. So, so watch this. I'll go back here to my, oh, my command prompt. Let's scoot this up over here. Hit the up arrow. And I see I can still Telnet into the device, right? Now, if I go, go here and I do transport input and I just do SSH now now I've I've disabled telnet and I come back here and I hit the up arrow it's like I'm sorry no soup for you I cannot connect to the host on port 23 connection failed because I'm no longer allowing the telnet protocol now let me get back to when I first said this I said why do you take the risk of using telnet why why do that and I said if SSH is just as easy to use and I said asterisk quotes and all that kind of stuff just as easy is is not the case and that's probably why telnet is still around is Microsoft never included a command line SSH client Shame on you, Microsoft, for not doing that. They've always allowed Telnet. Unix, Linux, they've always uh, supported SSH from a command line, but not Microsoft. Uh, so in order to use SSH, we have to download a different program, like PuTTY, like TerraTerm, like, uh, does, does this support it? TCP? No, no. So uh, uh, TerraTerm by itself does not support SSH. Um, it does Telnet only. However, you can download a SSH version of TerraTerm. So let's let's uh, let, let's actually go with PuTTY. That one's nice and easy. Uh, TerraTerm I have to install. Uh, now watch this. I'm gonna I'm gonna do PuTTY just on Google. Here's my download page. Uh, notice right here, legal warning. There are countries out there 
that don't allow you to encrypt your data beyond a certain level. Essentially, there's government entities out there that say, we want to be able to know what you're doing. Now, the United States is not one of those. Canada is not one of those. Mexico is not one. I mean, but I, I would definitely make sure that you know before you do this uh, what your country supports because a lot of these countries will monitor and they'll see what algorithms you're using for encryption. And if it's something that is beyond what they can decrypt, uh, you're going to get a knock on the door or I'm in the United States. I don't know what other countries do. I don't know if doors are being kicked down, you know, explosions. I don't know. It's a weird world out there. So the point is, be careful uh, with, with what kind of encryption you use in your country. Here we can use whatever we want. I'm going to go download Putty, uh, which this is, you know, just uh, actually it looks like I've downloaded it before because it's saying I'm downloading Putty 1. So I open Putty, and it says, okay, what do you want to do? And you've got uh, Telnet. R login, SSH, serial port. So I'm going to SSH, and I'm going to type in 10.1.1.10, which is the IP address of my switch. Click on Open. Now check this out. It says, this server's host key is not cached in the registry. You have no guarantee that this server is the computer you think it is. <laughs> What's that mean? That kind of creeps me out. What it means is Putty just recognized this switch is using a certificate, it's using encryption keys that it just made up itself. So it's saying, you know what, this is your first time connecting here. It's saying that I approved my own certificate. You have no guarantee that this server really is the device that you think it is. If you're okay with that, go ahead and hit yes. Now I will say almost always we're okay with that. We, you know, in, in our organizations will typically generate our own cert server certificates. Now Putty memorizes that certificate. It says, okay, then from here on out, this, uh, this device, this MAC address, this IP address, this, you know, everything is now bound to that, that key. And it's not going to ask you that again. It said, I, you said, I trust it. And the only way uh, it'll flag that message again is maybe another device gives you that same certificate. You know, some other device out there says, oh, I've got the same same encryption keys as the other guy. It's going to be like, whoa, sabotage. So now it's asking me, well, who do you want to log in as? Jeremy. This is the user account that I created. What is Jeremy's password? Cisco. <laughs> Not what I expected. It was Cisco, right? Cisco. Hmm. Okay, troubleshooting. Actually, I think I know what it is. Uh, I, there's a command I forgot to show you. Let's do a show run, and I'm going to begin with, oh, saying, oh, sorry, you timed out. So let's begin with uh, lines. So we'll just zoom into those VTY lines. Uh, yeah, there's, there's the problem. So one more command under those VTY lines. Let's go into global config mode. I'm going to do line VTY 0 space 15. Get back under there. See right here that it says login, all right? Login, I know it seems like, okay, well, that's simple enough, right? It, isn't that uh, all there is to it? Login says, okay, log people into the, these ports, but use the password that's under here. Now, that's a problem because uh, we are trying to use username and password, and under the ports, there's only a password. So essentially, login is useful for Telnet to say, you know, Telnet in, and you're, you can use this password. They link together. But, and, and this sounds a little funny to do this, but instead, we actually go to the VTY lines and type in login local. What that says to the device is use the local user database for your logins. Don't don't just try and log in people uh, and only require the password because frankly SSH doesn't even support that. It needs a username and a password. Uh, instead, log in using the local database on here. Now this this is as an alternative to log in using the TACAX server. Now what's what's up with that? So when when we get big enough uh, we can set up our, our switches to where, you know, I don't want the user accounts on these switches because I have hundreds of them and routers and all this kind of stuff. And I don't, I don't want to have to have uh, usernames and passwords that I change on a regular basis uh, where I, I tell that into or SSH into to 50 or 100 different devices on a monthly basis and change everybody's password because that's a good security practice. Instead, what you can use is something called a TACAX server. 
Cisco makes them. And all the devices say, well, I'll get my user accounts from TACAX. So when I say on the, on the port, login space TACAX, it says when somebody tries to log into these VTY lines, check their credentials against the TACAX server. And that's where you create your user accounts. So then I change my password in one place, uh, and all the devices say, oh, looks like there's a password change, you know, because uh, you know, they, they all just report to that centralized server. So, so that's, that's the piece. So we can either log in using TACAX, which is a server, log in using local, which is the local user database on that device. It's going to be what we do here. Or we can just type in login, which says use the password. So uh, I'll type it again just for grins. Login local. Uh, and now I'll go back to Putty. Give me my, my error. Let's go to uh, restart session. There we go. Login as Jeremy. And this time password of Cisco. There we go. That's what I want to see. So it was, it was the login local. Man, I, I can't believe I forgot that. So create the user. So choose to allow Telnet and SSH. That was the transport uh, input. And then also, seven, uh, enable local login. I guess I could just group that under that one, one, uh, one statement. So transport input, uh, telnet slash SSH, if we want to do that, and then uh, enable the local login uh, so that it uses the local user database. All right, so there is SSH in all its glory. And I know some of you are like, wait, summary, there's two more bullets on there. Well, yes, but those, those are really focused on what we did while we enabled SSH. Even though the goal of this was to enable SSH, we also learned how to manage existing user accounts uh, or manage user accounts on Cisco devices. That was what we did when I went to global configuration mode and created username Jeremy password or secret uh, Cisco to create user accounts. So that's... You can do that not only for SSH, but also for all kinds of other stuff. As a matter of fact, let me let me show this to you. Uh, I know we we disabled uh, Telnet by using transport input SSH, but if I do transport input Telnet and SSH now, watch what happens. I open my command prompt and type in Telnet 10.1.1.10, and notice now Telnet even is prompting me for a username, Jeremy and a password of Cisco. It's just not secure to do it that way because that's all transmitted in clear text. So, so this login local and these user accounts that we create impact both SSH and Telnet uh, when we do it, but also as you go down the road when you set up VPN connections, if you want to use web management, there's all kinds of things these user accounts are used for. You now know how to create them on Cisco devices. And then finally, encrypting passwords through using secret. So we create our user accounts uh, using username uh, you know, Jer uh, secret Cisco instead of username Jer password Cisco because password stores it in clear text. Uh, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> so <laughs> password stores it in clear text, uh, which is not secure. You can encrypt it using that service password encryption we saw in the last nugget, uh, which uses that Cracker Jacks encryption, but nothing beats that secret encryption level. All right, good. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.